reader for our second half. We're very privileged to have John Duda, who is, in, who is the co-founder of Red Emma's Coffee, mm -hmm. Coffee House, which will be a, a which, a Coffee House Collective, which is going to come up to North Avenue, two stores over. Um, right now it's closed for the summer, am I, am I correct in saying that? Yep. When is it going to be open? Uh, in the fall, probably early October. In the fall, early October, but that's going to be a great part of the transformation of the North, you know, the Arts District. So we look forward to that and hopefully you can send a couple more interesting readers our way. But thank you very much, John Duda. So I get it correctly. He works on communications with the Democracy Collaborative, a research group investigating new cooperative and community-based solutions to economic inequity. His writing focuses on urban development, autonomous social movements, and historical intersections between science and politics. He's also just gotten his PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And, uh, okay, so congratulations. All right, so I am, uh, as you can hear from that introduction, I'm a big nerd. Uh, and uh, I was excited to be asked to read uh, at this event, but I was also a little, a little, little bit of trepidation because I, I very rarely write in, if ever, in the first person. So I write, you know, sometimes political manifestos that are quasi-anonymous and filled with venom and best left buried where they lie. Um, I also write things that are a little more scholarly, a little more about history. Um, and so what I'm reading today, it's a little bit of an experiment. Um, just trying to take one of my kind of uh, cynical historical takes on urban policy um, and seeing if it'll work in the context of a public reading. Now, it may not, you may feel like you're in a boring lecture and if that's the case, I apologize, I never use the word I. It's all about history and history of ideas. Um, but I hope it's a, an engaging enough history and a history that's maybe a little relevant to the way we think about neighborhoods like this one uh, that it's appropriate for the event. <clears throat> okay. So, if faced with blocks upon blocks of vacant and crumbling buildings in a typical post-industrial American city, one likens the scene to a war zone. What exactly is at stake in such a comparison? from the war on poverty to the war on drugs. Military action uh, has been something of a privileged metaphor for dealing with the crisis in US cities. But who exactly is the enemy here? More precisely, what kind of urban life manages to put together a city both that serves as a public space, the site of everyday life, and as the front lines of a war? How has war become such a natural or naturalized element of urban life that we're so comfortable describing things in these terms? Uh, now, urban planning has never been far removed from military action. Uh, the development of the form of the city is a response not just to the dynamics of aggregation and accumulation and growth, uh, but also to the architectural demands placed on it by the need for defensive fortifications. Fernand Braudel, writing about the self-consciousness of towns, claims that, oh, roughly from the 15th to the 18th century, the architectural expression of urban identity worldwide was as a rule tied to the, the demands of military defense against external enemies. Right? So he links the transition from horizontal to vertical expansion with the revolution in fortification design, which followed from the introduction of artillery. The old ramparts could easily be moved outward to encompass a larger and larger city. The newer earthworks with their elaborate zones and their characteristics, crazy star-shaped designs were too expensive to move and therefore constrained expansion, leading to more intensive vertical development, i.e. the birth of the skyscraper. If the modern city, on the other hand, is no longer so strongly coupled to the project of defense against external enemies on the other side of the gate or the wall, it is nevertheless still possible to trace a military imperative at work in urban design as the enemy becomes something internal to the city. Walter Benjamin in his Arcades project pinpoints precisely such a mutation in the military logic of urbanism. This is Baron Haussmann's infamous project to clear and redevelop Paris. I quote, 
The true goal of Hausmann's projects was to secure the city against civil war. He wanted to make the erection of barricades in the streets of Paris impossible for all times. Hausmann seeks to forestall such combat in two ways. Widening the streets will make the erection of barricades impossible, and new streets will connect the barracks in straight lines with the workers' districts. Contemporaries christened the operation strategic embellishment. Benjamin cites a, a clear turning point in the architecture of urban defense in this work, the Arcades Project. And this is a remark by Maxime Ducamp, who says, if there were only Parisians in Paris, there would be no revolutionaries. And just a few lines later, Haussmann's attitude towards the Parisian population recalls that of Guizot towards the proletariat. Guizot characterized the proletariat as the external population. Guizot, a French statement whose intolerance for popular protest earned him a privileged place along with the Pope, the Tsar, and Metternich, uh, in the Holy Alliance Against Communism famously evoked in the opening lines of the Communist Manifesto. Uh, but he reveals with his paradoxical phrase, external population, a great deal. The city is no longer defined in relation to some exterior, exterior enemy, but rather is developed to facilitate control of an enemy with, which lives within it. Permanent war abandons the ramparts for the boulevards. It is this topological involution, this trope of a city at war with itself, which helps us make sense of the recent historical trajectory of the American city. Uh, now, is it unreasonable to suggest that the demands of military action and national security played a significant role in American urban planning during the Cold War? One of the major determinants of the character of contemporary American cities was at least rhetorically linked to such concerns, the national highway system, officially known as the National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. In his uh, 1955 address to Congress seeking funding for the project, Eisenhower outlined four reasons why the system had to be built, the third of which ran as follows. In the case of an atomic attack on our key cities, the road net must permit quick evacuation of target areas mobilization of defense forces, and maintenance of every essential economic function. But the present system in critical areas would be the breeder of a deadly congestion within hours of an attack. A broad consensus quickly emerged in the post-World War II period within the national security apparatus, including think tanks like the Rand Corporation, that densely populated urban cores with the concomitant concentration of economic activity presented simply too easy a target in an age when city-leveling nuclear attacks were possible. So the 1950s equivalent of strategic embellishment was the dissolution of urban areas through dispensive dispersal, a vision which, if never quite implemented as such, remained available to overcode and legitimate through political expedient reference to the imperatives of national security, parallel developments on the ground, including the penetration of cities by the highway system and the wholesale clearance tactics of urban renewal. There's a peculiar ambiguity characteristic of this intersection between military logic and the lives of cities, where city planners develop robust arguments that along with reducing a population's vulnerability to attack, propose designs that would improve the quality or ostensibly improve the quality of urban life. This double justification, where the imperatives of national security and quality, li quality of life seem to coincide, as if magically by accident, reappears in much of the planning which addresses itself to the urban crisis erupting in the riots of the 1960s, so much so that it often becomes difficult to disentangle the two. What is particularly dangerous about the way in which these two very different imperatives, the logic of total war and the rationalized reconstruction of the urban environment, are made coincident, is how this conjunction allows the war being fought to become hidden, reduced to a matter of taste, good design, and common sense. If this was problematic enough in the period when the city was being reworked on the think tanks drafting boards to fight the Cold War, it becomes disastrous when the enemy becomes identified with the populations of the cities themselves. Just like the strange moments of language highlighted by Benjamin in which the topology of the city at war folds in on itself, we discover similar metaphorical moves equating the total terror of atomic attack with the urban crisis, with such comments as, Unless someone comes up with some jolly good solutions, the problem facing cities may become more lethal than the bomb. It's Barbara Ward in 1964. Or, the dark ghettos now represent a nuclear stockpile which can annihilate the very foundations of America. That's Kenneth Clark in 1965. But Kenneth Clark quote here 
uh, is from a book called Dark Ghetto. And this is an important moment in the development of an anti-racist sociology. And it's a genuine attempt on the part of an African-American scholar to address the problems facing the ghetto. It's often cited as one of the turning points in American public discourse regarding the devastating consequences of urban segregation. Uh, but it's not Clark's suggestions for change, nor solely his uncompromising depiction of the horrors of life in the ghetto that proved most, most influential in his book's reception. Rather, it was the way that the twin horrors of economic uh, deprivation and subjective disempowerment form a self-perpetuating cycle. This, my claim is that this conclusion, that the self-reinforcing ghetto would thwart any efforts to ameliorate it, and therefore that the only way to help those trapped in the ghetto would be to destroy the ghetto, was precisely the vector by which a logic of war came to be internalized in seemingly credible and sincere efforts to address problems of urban economic inequality and racial segregation. Now, nowhere is this clearer than in the Kerner Commission report, which was officially titled the Report of the National Advisory Committee on Civil Disorders. The report is broken into three sections, what happened, why did it happen, and what can be done. The first section does a fair job tracing out the particulars of the urban riots that erupted across the United States during the long, hot summer of 1967. The second section essentially redeploys the argument of dark ghetto, using a sociological analysis of ghetto conditions to provide a psychological explanation of the riot, flushing out the basic conclusion of the report. Our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. There's a very interesting reading of the Kerner Report advanced by many scholars, analyzing what's been called the elaborate processing of racial, racial crisis wherein the specially convened commission is deployed over and over again in the aftermath of American racial violence as a strategy for managing and diffusing that crisis without making any serious concessions towards social transformation. So the riot commission here functions to depoliticize urban rebellion by integrating a fundamentally anti-systemic demand, rejecting the legitimacy back into the, uh, the political order, back into that very same order. So the rhetoric of pluralist reconciliation in something like the Kerner Report which rejects rioters as political actors, becomes a technique for shoring up elite dominance in the face of anti-systemic agitation and revolt. And we see that reflected in the concrete recommendations contained in its strategy, in the third part. Uh, in chapter 17, for instance, the report states, we believe that federally aided low and moderate income housing programs must be reoriented so that the major thrust is in non-ghetto areas. Public housing programs should emphasize scattered site construction, rent supplements should, wherever possible, be used in non-ghetto areas. Working backwards through the logic leading up to this recommendation, one learns that spending money in the places where poor African Americans actually live would be counterproductive, since the ghetto's singular and self-reinforcing intractability means that any plan addressing racial and economic injustice which did not take as its major premise the elimination of concentrated African-American populations in the urban core could only have the consequence that, quote, the Negro society will be permanently relegated to its current status, possibly even if we expend great amounts of money and effort trying to gild the ghetto. Similarly, we learn that ceding political sovereignty to urban African-American populations, while a noble goal consonant with the grand narrative of American political life, would only condemn these populations to the ravages of the inescapable ghetto more completely. Such Negro development would only, uh, sorry, such Negro political development would also involve virtually complete racial segregation and virtually complete spatial separation. What the Kerner Report does is to take the military notion of urban dispersal developed to defend citizens against atomic attack and redeploy it within the context of addressing the problems of the ghetto. The political content of ghetto revolt is neutralized with the same stroke that naturalizes the, the conditions of poverty and brutality that have brought forth that revolt. Thus, the only solution, according to the report, is to eliminate the ghetto by dispersing its inhabitants. This reading of the Kerner Report's housing policy recommendations as essentially a counterinsurgency program is of course at odds with the history of the report's reception as a landmark in the development of American anti-racist public discourse. But tracing the sources of these recommendations makes this reading a lot more plausible. In particular, we can note that the strategy of dispersal was being discussed in defense intellectual circles before the public Kerner Report. In particular, the Rand Corporation publishing reports like Cities in Trouble, an Agenda for Urban Research, and Contribution to the Analysis of Urban Problems had already written on urban crisis management. 
Among the most prominent of the RAND intellectuals working on urban housing problems was Anthony Downs, who had previously served as a member of Lyndon Johnson's National Com Commission on Urban Problems, and who likely wrote, or at least directed, much of the Kerner's report's material on urban housing policy and the ghetto. What's interesting about Downs' work is not just that he, his assertions that spatial deconcentration, the program of deliberate dispersal, which underlies the housing recommendations of the Kerner Report, and which would be, incidentally become official HUD policy, is objectively the only way to help inner city African Americans. Downs also makes explicit that a necessary and integral component of this solution is the elimination of the urban poor as a class capable of representing its own interests, with a majority at the community level. This neutralization must take place not only in the suburban neighborhoods that will receive the relocated black population, but also in the inner city regions that will, as a result of mobility programs, attract redevelopment on the condition that middle class and de facto white sociopolitical dominance is reestablished in these regions. In Downs project, the scientific prognosis of white liberalism regarding the future of the Greto crystallizes together with the program of total urban war against a subjugated population whose concentration in the inner cities gave them unacceptable and dangerous leverage against the racist, racist status quo and the project of continuing capitalist accumulation. Superficially, Down's intentions seem blameless. He makes a point of addressing racism as a moral problem with deep historical roots. But for Downs, the historical and sociological fact of racism is posited as a given which can then justify deconcentration of the urban poor on the grounds that economic redevelopment could not begin without accommodating the racist attitudes of the middle class. It is in this context that we can understand perhaps the most infamous passage in Downs' book called Opening the Suburbs. Downs writes that, Considering economic factors alone, it would be far cheaper to repress future large-scale urban violence through police and military action than to pay for effective programs against remaining urban poverty. This might require abrogating the civil rights of many citizens deplorably, yet it could be done with little other inconvenience to the middle class. Cited out of the rhetorical context in which it's situated, an argument in favor of addressing urban poverty through ostensibly civil means like housing policy, the quote is certainly chilling. More troubling, however, is that the civil project of deconcentration, juxtaposed against the hypothetical imposition of martial law, appears as a military stratagem of dispersal, aimed at the capture of a territory from an enemy population excluded from the polis. Real estate is war carried out by other means. I think I'll end there. Thank you. thought-provoking piece, particularly given what's happening in Baltimore these days. It's hard not to think about all the news about increased police presence as the answer to this raft of violence lately. Thanks, John. Um, 